Hello, everyone, and welcome to Contributing to Kubernetes in its second decade, SIG Contribex style. We'll explain some of what uh, that stuff means in a moment. But first, we'll introduce ourselves. Who, I guess I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Kazlyn Fields, and I am a developer advocate for GKE and open source Kubernetes at Google Cloud, or at least I was until last week when I became a manager. And I am also a co-chair of the special interest group for contributor experience and a co-lead of a sub-project within that uh, special interest group, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Hey everyone, my name is Priyanka Sagu. I work at SUSE as a Kubernetes integration engineer, and I'm also one of the technical leads for SIG Contributor Experience. Hi, I'm Navarun. I'm a principal engineer at Broadcom. I do control plane stuff usually in the community and in KCP. I'm also one of the chairs of uh, the SIG, and I have, um, I'm a Emeritus Steering Committee member. Hi. My name is Madhav. I am a tech lead for Contrabex. I also do some work in API machinery and etcd, a little bit in architecture as well. Um, I am back to being a student. I'm doing research at UIUC, so that's a little that's fun. Uh, and this is something that this is a talk I love giving. So I'm, I'm hoping you take something away from it. Let's get started. So. Um before we get into everything and, and, uh, on how to contribute to the Kubernetes project, or especially SIG Contribux, let's look at the, some metrics, some statistics. And this is how our Kubernetes community looks like today. We met on Monday. We had the amazing KCS event, Kubernetes Contributor Summit event, which is one of the last one of this format. We'll be changing it. That's a different thing. Um, this is an event specifically for all the people who contribute to the Kubernetes project in capacity of maintainers, reviewers, approvers, and people who are org members of the project. So this is a photo of our uh, event um, this last Monday. These are the numbers we have as of this month uh, for the Kubernetes project. And these numbers are coming from the Kubernetes dev stats. There is a link at the bottom once we, uh, the slide deck will be available later. So here we can see we have grown so much. The Kubernetes project has grown so much in the last 10 years. We are talking about 92,000 contributors. More than four, I would say 4.5 million contributions. Maybe we already crossed that after we took the snapshots. And we have about 7.4 thousand reviewers, which is, which is so many contributions, and that is the number of reviewers. So we, we have a lot of work, and we need a lot of help as well. And if this graph shows us how we have grown over the years. We are starting from 2015 here, and 2023 we are at, uh, I think, around 70,000 or 80,000 mark. Yeah, so this is this, this is a scale of growth for Kubernetes project, and we need help, and we want more contributors, but we have resources to help people how to do that, or what does the organization of Kubernetes project looks like if if people want to find their place in the project. So this is how the Kubernetes community is structured. Starting from the bottom, we have the vertical components. Um, before I start talking about vertical, horizontal project, just look at the keys there. We have something called SIG, S-I-G, uh, in the dark blue box. That stands for special interest groups. That is a group of people or a a group of um, leaders and people under them, or co contributors under them. Uh, and this particular uh, entity of the Kubernetes project could own code, or uh, there is no deadline attached to it. So you have these SIGs, and they own code. They own areas of the Kubernetes project. They provide guidance. And then we have another box right below that, which is working group. That is for specific time-bound areas, which Somebody, uh, people from the project who want to trouble, uh, who want to maybe let's say uh, work on something, try try out something, but for a definite period of time. And once they achieved what they wanted uh, to get out of that working group, the working group dissolves, or maybe it becomes part of a bigger uh, sig 
depends on uh, what's the intent of the working group. So now we know what those blocks are. Uh, starting from the bottom, we have the vertical components. These are uh, components of the Kubernetes project, which are vertical, single components, specific components like node, storage. So everything related to node is taken care by let's say a SIG, um, which is blue box there, um, SIG node, same for SIG storage, patch, and rest of the block boxes there. Right above that, we have the horizontal boxes. These SIGs or working groups are span across multiple, um, like they, they span across multiple components of Kubernetes project. So for example, we have the LTS um, working group, or we have the policy working group, or CLI working group. These are the components that might be interacting or working with many of the vertical uh, components right below it. And at the top, we have projects. Uh, so SIGs that help each of the blocks below uh, in terms of providing resources, helping with the infrastructure, or even releasing everything that each of the vertical and horizontal components uh, the SIGs are doing. Uh, for example, SIG release uh, takes, takes all of the work as part of really Kubernetes release cycles and build releases and artifacts out of that. So we have those project blocks at the top that are kind of governance or, uh, or not governance, basically uh, bodies that help each, uh, everything in the Kubernetes project. Um, yeah, and then there is nothing, it's not mentioned here, we also have committees, like steering committee or code of conduct committee. They don't work or they don't own a specific component of the uh, Kubernetes project, but they are like the governing bodies. They help take decisions for the entire community or maybe help uh, take decisions, building directions for the community and uh, liaisoning with CNCF in general. So. That's how the Kubernetes community structure looks like today. And then once you are part of any of these blocks, as a contributor, maybe as a member, you can grow up the ladder in within that group, or you can maybe hop on, hop off between six, depending on what kind of work you are doing. For example, we said vertical groups on single area, but horizontal works across, so if you are part of let's say CI, uh, SIG CLI, you will be interacting maybe many of those vertical uh, components down there. So how does the contributor ladder looks for somebody who is contributing to one of those SIGs? We start with being a member. If you are contributing for a while, if you are contributing for a, a continued period of time for months, and you have made significant contributions, you can open up a request to become an org member, and that's where you start. You start by becoming an org member, a Kubernetes project member. Once you are an org member and you are contributing uh, more and more to a particular area, you are providing guidance um, to the uh, developments happening in a particular SIG. Maybe you are reviewing code, maybe you are helping with reviewing code, maybe you are triaging stuff. So the SIG leads can help you, or if the, whenever there is a requirement, can help you become a reviewer. And same for approver. The next step after reviewer is becoming an approver. Now you were, before that you were uh, reviewing code, now you also have the powers to merge that code or approve that code, and then so on. So you, uh, once you are a reviewer and approver for a long time, and there is trust building, and you have done it for a long time uh, enough that you can now get honor uh, privileges. So the next step in the ladder is uh, sub-project owner, followed by a sub-project lead. Um, and then the fine print of what is what is there in the boxes, but it also varies from SIG to SIG. The big idea here is you have to stay there, you have to spend time uh, and build trust. Trust building is the key here. And finally, the biggest at the top of the ladder is becoming chair or technical lead of a special interest group, and there is, it's not mentioned here, you can also become a steering committee that does not require going through this ladder. Um, there is a whole charter for that. But yeah, steering committee is the biggest um, thing we have in the Kubernetes project. Yeah, and next up we have the new contributor orientation. 
So a new initiative our group created just a couple of months ago is new contributor orientation. New contributor orientation is meant to orient new contributors in the Kubernetes community by providing them with a brief overview of what Kubernetes does, how the community is structured, which you just received a bit of, and how they might fit into it. The meetings are held once a month in two time zones on the third Tuesday of the month. So the next one is going to be next week on Tuesday. If you would like to become a contributor, I highly recommend that you join the new contributor orientation meeting. There is an EMEA APAC friendly one at 1.30 in the morning Pacific time, which is my time zone. Um, and there is an America's, more America's friendly time uh, at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, if none of these times work for you, then we do record all of the sessions and you can check them out on the Kubernetes YouTube channel. Each session is one hour long and consists of about 40 minutes of presented content followed by about 20 minutes of freeform Q&A with active contributors. Anyone can attend this meeting, active contributors, brand new folks, students, whatever walk of life you may be in. If you're interested in the community, we welcome you to new contributor orientation. And as I said, the sessions are recorded and published. We cover a variety of topics in our presentation. First off, we welcome everyone to the community, of course. Then we explain a little bit about what Kubernetes is as a technology. Then we go over the Kubernetes community structure, including the contributor ladder and the SIG diagram that you saw earlier. Then we go over what it means to be a contributor, which uh, really is where the contributor ladder is. How to start contributing, we go over how you find out more information about special interest groups um, so that you can choose the right special interest group that best matches what you want to get out of contributing to the community. Why you want to become a contributor is very important to this whole process. And then we go over current work opportunities. So we reach out to the SIGs each time we run one of these sessions to ask them what their current open tasks are. And we split that up into two types. One is evergreen asks, things that are always needed um, and could always use some help, or tasks with skills. So if you have particular skills, like you know a specific programming language or something like that, we'll let you know about requests for those types of skills. And then we go over contribution pitfalls and have our Q&A session. Uh, there is also a build into this sometimes where I mentioned that the uh, current work opportunities is basically the only thing that changes. The rest of the session is the same, except, of course, for the Q&A as well. So we've run two of these sessions now. You can see that there's a big difference between them. In September, we ran our first session for Americas and APAC, and uh, in October, we ran our second. When we did our first session, we did some promotion on social media, and we didn't do very much promotion on social media for our second session. There was also a slight issue with the uh, Zoom setup for the APAC uh, first session, so that could have been higher as well. So we're working on doing more social media promotion for these meetings. If you want to know more, there's a GitHub repo where we have all sorts of information about how to get involved with our new contributor orientation meetings um, and what is in them. It also has the PDFs of the slide decks uh, and the link to the playlist, of course. Next, we're going to talk about content releases. Okay. So I'll quickly go over like what we shipped in terms of like helping the contributors in knowing about the community. Um, one thing before we dig into like what have we shipped, one thing I wanted to mention is that what do we do as a contribex? So one very important thing that we do is to make the experience of the contributors easier and make their make their journey really easy in contributing to the community and making sure that each contributor is equip equipped with anything that they need in order to work in their specific areas. So to help them, we ship a few blogs. And in 2024, we shipped 14 blogs and eight uh, uh, spotlight blogs where we covered uh, the different SIGs, working groups, and committees. Uh, we also shipped uh, blogs on the Kubernetes.io website, which is the public-facing website, and there were 45 of them in 2024. And we did a lot in social media. I'll hand it over to Kaislin. And now it's back to me. Let's talk a little bit about social media for the project. That is something that SIG Contribex owns in the COM sub-project, which I am a co-lead of. 
So we have a variety of channels, both end user facing and contributor facing. So in terms of end user facing channels, we recently, uh, this year, well, I guess at the beginning of the year, got access to the Kubernetes LinkedIn, or took over the Kubernetes LinkedIn, um, and it has seen massive growth. A really interesting statistic on this one is that our impressions have gone up 12.56 million percent. <laughs> So we've been posting a lot on LinkedIn, and uh, we've also grown from like 1,000 followers to nearly, well, 7,500, 7,650. Um, on X, uh, Kubernetes IO is our largest uh, account in terms of followers. We have 309,000 followers on there, um, and we have seen some growth in tweets, in impressions, in engagements, all across the board. And then just on November 4th, just 11 days ago, we created a Blue Sky account for Kubernetes IO, and it already has 2,570 followers. In terms of contributor-facing channels, these are social media channels that we use to reach out to uh, contributors in the community to tell them about things that are going on. So we have Kate's contributors on X, which has over 13,000 followers, about 13,500. Um, we've done a lot of tweeting on that this year, um, but we have seen a decline in a variety of areas on X. Uh, we've seen a lot of the community moving over to Blue Sky. Um, I, didn't put in the graphs here, but there are some interesting graphs where you can actually see the, the bottoming out as people kind of uh, leave X for Blue Sky. And on our Kubernetes.dev Blue Sky, which we also created 11 days ago, we currently have 304 followers. Um, and we do also have a Mastodon account where we have 301 followers. So we want to uh, also send some shout outs. And Nabarun is going to cover those. Yeah. So we're doing a lot in the SIG. And who does this? a lot of our contributors. So we wanted to give a shout out to the contributors who have been shining really well in the past uh, few months and in this year. And this is a highlight from who we, give con we, who we gave contributor awards to in the Contributor Summit. I want to mention like Arvind, Sandeep, Jason, Mario, Sridham, and Noah. They really helped us like do and get a lot of things done in the various sub-projects of the SIG. And in addition, a lot of our contributors have also helped us lift and shift a lot of different kind of things across the community. So I want to give a shout out to Josh, Chris, and Caselyn for doing all that they have been doing for the community. And now, we have talked about what we do and some metrics. Now, how can you help? There are a few areas in Contribex that require like really urgent help and if you have those specific skill sets, you probably can come in and help us move things there as well. First thing, um, how many of you know that Kubernetes runs a couple of elections every year? Awesome, quite a few people. Okay, so we do run the steering committee elections, the code of conduct committee elections, we help the steering committee run them, and then there's a GB election every two years as well where the community nominates someone amongst the emeritus and the current steering committee members to represent the Kubernetes project on the governing board. And in order to do that, uh, to do the election, we used to use a different platform, but uh, the community decided that we can build our own uh, because it gives us a lot more flexibility and power to uh, change things around or host elections as and when we want to. But we need a lot of help. Um, so if you know uh, Python or Flask, and you are really interested in contributing something to the Kubernetes community, please do reach out in the Electo dev channel on, and sync contribute selections on the Kubernetes Slack um, to know more. We do need a lot of help in testing and setting up testing uh, infrastructure for the various pages of Electo and the algorithm is well tested, but the pages and the other functionality need a lot of tests. Then we have the contributor site. The contributor site holds a lot of information about how uh, can people contribute to the community. We mirror a lot of stuff from GitHub to the contributor site where things are more accessible and uh, the SEO is quite better. In order to do that, we use a generator written in Bash, but uh, it's, uh, it's a little tough to maintain over time. So we want to move to using Hugo's Goldmark renderer to build those pages. So if you have expertise in Bash and Hugo, do reach out to us again. We need uh, help there. 
And one of the sub-projects of the SIG is the group mentoring cohorts. So we run or we help other SIGs or other areas in the community run mentoring cohorts to get new contributors or grow existing contributors to leaders or maintainers in those specific areas. Um, we have been thinking of like overhauling a, a few things in the group mentoring cohort program. So uh, uh, we do uh, have Sylvester who is spending a lot of time in helping us like structure out the mentoring cohorts. So uh, they need a lot of help. So if you want to help um, in managing stuff around, that's a great area to start with. Having said that, I'll pass it on to Madhav. Okay. Um, so. We've spoken a lot, a little bit about the, some of the areas that we currently need help in. Uh, Contrabex also helps maintain and develop quite a few other areas as well, uh, similar to other six. So for example, there are many technical aspects of contributor experience as well. So you have things like, you have a lot of automation in the community. Uh, we manage things like GitHub teams, GitHub permissions. All of those things are automated as YAML files in GitHub repositories. These are just some examples. Similarly, other SIGs also have various other things that they currently need help with and various other things that they've matured over time and they help maintain right now. So once you come into the community, once you sort of have an inkling of, okay, this, is, this area sounds, seems kind of cool, maybe you know I, I can help out here, uh, you, you, you'll dive in, but you may face some common pitfalls that I'll try and go over just so that you're aware that this is something that other people have faced as well. And that's not something that is specific to you. And it's okay if you get overwhelmed because this is something that other people have gone through as well. And you can get, uh, you, you can get specific help if you need, if you need it. So uh, some common pitfalls. Um, th the good first issue, I'm calling it a trap just to put extra emphasis on this might happen to you. And there's a very good chance that it will happen to you. A uh, good first issue is a very good sort of indicator as to if some issue or some piece of work needs help and it's big enough friendly in the community. However, over time in Kubernetes, uh, especially if you sort of come into the main Kubernetes repository, you may, same, you may face uh, some complexities around some things that are also called, uh, that, that are called good first issues. So if you come in with the mindset that, oh, this is going to be something that's super easy to do, something that's scoped, something that's easy for me to do as a beginner, you may be right. It, it, that, that, was, that may as well have been the intention when it was marked as good first issue. But considering the complexity that may be involved with the part of the code base that you're changing, that change that you are making may affect something else that may come up in review cycles, that may come up in PR reviews, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, you are overwhelmed with, oh, I have no clue what this other part of the code base is. So for example, if you look at the diagram there, you're starting with the contributor journey. You start off with sig foo, like, OK, cool. That's my area of interest. I want to do some work here. I'm going to try and do some work here. But then suddenly, you realize, oh, the, that this change involves sig bar, and that change involves wg abc, and, and so on and so forth. That takes some time. But the good thing with this is later on when you come and start a new contribution, the next contribution that you start may require SIGBAR as well, but you already have context and knowledge of SIGBAR from your first contribution. So the, 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 the rule over here, or no, not the rule, but the takeaway over here is if you try and stick around just a little longer, you end up caching a lot of context in the community. And that compounds quite a bit. Uh, so this is one common pitfall that you may face. Most contributors sort of get lost in that phase that, okay, I started with this sake, I spent a lot of time understanding what's going on, but now I have to spend that much more time understanding some other part of the code base that I had no idea about or even interest in. So that's where most folks get overwhelmed. And to be honest, I got super overwhelmed there as well, but I was fortunate enough to have people around me to sort of help me through that. So I'm telling you this now, this may happen to you, but if it does, it's completely okay. It's even fun because you get to learn something that you had no idea, no idea you were gonna get to learn, get to learn right? So that's super cool. Um, so try avoiding that trap. Uh, of course, look at good first issues. See, those are good indicators as to something that is okay to get started with and is, is big enough friendly to get started with. But uh, the best way and sort of the most sustainable way if you want to get started is if you like pick something, pick an area that you're interested in. If you're not sure what area that is, that's completely fine too. If you go and look at what areas exist, if something even sounds remotely cool, that's fine, pick that. But just stick around for a little bit, see what, see what happens. And more importantly, uh, you have a lot of moving parts in the community. There's a lot of entropy, there's a lot of chaos. Uh, so, you know, uh, 
just just to sort of give the most non answer answer to all of your questions embrace that chaos just a little bit trust me on this i don't have a better answer for you this just, just a little bit just embrace it a little bit but it it works it really really works mainly because if you stick around past that initial initial barrier people are like okay this person is going to stick around let me help them out right so it's also easier to get help that way um and of course if you don't find a sig interesting enough we have we follow something called the law of mobility so you know um, feel free to move around feel free to pick some other area up feel free to explore other projects as well if that's what you want to do but it's that's completely fine too uh and as always we do need your help regardless of what your background is what your experience is what role you are in if you're a student if you're not a student if you're a pm it doesn't really matter uh we really really do need your help because i'm pretty sure there is some area of kubernetes that could really use your expertise yep okay so a few reminders and heads ups before we go to the end of the session so kubecon india is going to happen in the second week of december and we do have a maintainer summit in india so if you are attending kubecon india and satisfy the criteria to join the maintainer summit please do register the registrations are still open uh the cfps are already closed and we do have a really great schedule but there are also a few unconferences so there are some open sessions where you can come and talk about your favorite topic or set up things uh set up sessions for uh yourself and after that we do have uh kubecon in london kubecon europe in london 2025 there will be another maintainer summit over there for that the cfps are also open as well as the registrations so if you do get your cfp selected you will also get a kubecon pass in addition to the maintainer summit pass so these are two key heads ups for the next few months and the cfps are going to close really soon for kubecon eu maintainer summit so please do make sure you get your uh, proposal in the criteria for submitting is if you are a graduated org member or an incubating or incubating project maintainer then you can submit uh, cfps having said that um how do you how do you come talk to us um we are always available on the kubernetes slack you can join the slack by going to slack.ks.io and we usually hang around in um, sig hyphen contribex channel there are a lot of other channels as well so feel free to join whatever you wish to um like stick around and please do join the mailing list as well it's uh, kubernetes uh, hyphen sig hyphen contribex at the rate googleusergroups.com um joining the mailing list is very important because that gives you an access to the meeting notes as well as it will add the regular meetings that we have uh, the biweekly meetings as well as the other sub project meetings inside the sig to your calendar and you can just join those meetings we really look forward to seeing you the journey is beautiful as well as tough and we would really love to help you in your contributing journey um having said that we uh, do have some time for question and answers so if you have any questions please feel free to go to the two mics over there in the middle of the uh room hey um So I have two questions. Um first one is just regarding the maintainer summit is this like are we renaming the contributor summit or is it something else? I actually have a whole slide deck on this that I could bring up. We do have 7 <laughs> <seven> minutes. <laughs> well, 6 minutes now. Um but so the maintainer summit is a shift from the contributor summit in terms of the uh, attendee experience. Um the primary differences are going to be that it it's all cncf projects it's not just kubernetes anymore um and it's going to be primarily run by the cncf so past contributor summits have been uh kind of led and managed by a group of volunteers from within the community um events are a sub project of sig contribex so we have leads for a variety of different areas including things like registration and content but those types of areas will now be covered by the cncf they will run the cfp um and they will handle registration themselves and that's how we're going to be able to uh, also get uh kubecon tickets for 
folks who are speaking at that, in addition to having sponsors. This is going to be something that is open to sponsorship, and the CNCF is working out exactly what uh, sponsorship will mean, but uh, there's not going to be a sponsor showcase or anything like that at the Maintainer Summit. We're going to use that additional money to be able to hold the Maintainer Summit on a day that is not the day zero events, since a lot of our contributors have uh, interactions with colos, and when we're on the same day as the colos, a lot of folks can't make it. So uh, that helps us both with the KubeCon ticket and with those. Uh, and, and as far as like the naming, aren't you concerned that the fact that it has like Maintainer in it it's going to cause like contributors to think that, okay, if I'm not a project maintainer, I'm not eligible, if, if that makes sense at all? That is correct for anything below graduated. Uh, so any incubating projects, and I don't remember right now if sandbox maintainers are able to come. I think they are. Okay, they can submit CFPs. Yeah, they can attend but not submit CFPs. So any sandbox or incubating projects, only maintainers are allowed to come. Uh, only graduated projects can have their org members also join. Gotcha. So, so for example, if I'm a Kubernetes org member, I'm not a maintainer, I would still be eligible, but... That's correct. And we're not concerned about confusion from, from that standpoint? Like, the fact that I had to ask, that's why I'm like, sorry for, you know, <laughs> insisting on that. I mean, you're, you're not <laughs> wrong. Obviously, there is opportunity for confusion there. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for confusion in this transition, which is why we need to have a lot of comms. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you. And, and for my second, I guess, question slash suggestion, um, going back to the new contributor orientation, you mentioned that there's going to be like the um, alternating like open work opportunities for other things. SIGs. Do you plan on having some sort of like a job board on, on your repo to say like these are the things that we're currently looking for contributors or something like that? So the way that this currently works is about a week before we run the new contributor orientation session, we send an email out to the leads list within open source Kubernetes and send them some reminder pings saying, hey, uh, here is the deck, update it with your newest open issues. Um, we do not have any plan to post that on like GitHub or anything to say like these are the open things because we already have the good first issue tag, which a lot of groups use. Um, this is just a, an opportunity for new contributors who want to attend the orientation to get a kind of single view of what's going on. But that's a good point. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Great session. Um, there were obviously a lot of ways for people to get plugged in, and I'm wondering if somebody comes to SIG ContribX and says, put me to work, what's the best place for me to start? What's the first thing I should do? What would you tell them? What's the first thing they should do? Come to the comms team meetings every week on Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. <laughs> the comms team within SIG ContribX uh, has an evergreen uh, project, which is uh, SIG Spotlight Blogs. So we invite our members to interview the leads of special interest groups, and then they write a blog about what they learned about that special interest group. So you don't have to have any knowledge of the project. You're just teaching other people what you learn from leaders in the community, and we publish that on very public channels. So you get a very nice public-facing contribution, um, and you get to learn about the community at the same time. So that's what I recommend. Thanks for the, for the talk. Um, so I'm curious about how the decision process works for promoting people in the contributor ladder. So for example, is it public? Are there like criteria? Um, yeah, how is that decided? It depends on the special interest group and the sub-project that you're working with. Um, so anything below SIG chair, basically, uh, Sub-projects can be run in different ways in different special interest groups, um, so they may have their own processes. As far as reviewer and approver, um, the sub-project owner will need to add you to the appropriate files in order to do that, so it's more about making sure that your work is visible and known to the leaders of the areas that you're working within. Uh, SIGCHAIR is kind of an exception there where it does have a formal process where you have to create a uh, issue on GitHub and we have a checklist of things that you need to transition to the new chair uh, before that can take over. And do people typically nominate themselves? Uh, do the leads reach out to them? 
So there, in our mentoring subproject, we have the opportunity to run uh, kind of internal mentoring cohorts. This is one thing that we recommend to the SIGs and subprojects. If you want to uh, train someone up for a specific role that you're having trouble finding someone for, they can run one of these mentoring cohorts. Um, aside from those mentoring cohorts, it's kind of on a per area basis. Um, we are out of time, but I can answer your question more in detail about the criteria. We do have some general criteria, and uh, it is also linked to from the slides. Um, but the subprojects can decide to like tweak the criteria a little, depending on what area the work is under. So I, I can catch up with you like in the hallway. Okay, thanks. And you can nominate yourself, basically, if yeah. you want to. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Mara. We have had folks nominate themselves. And please do nominate yourselves. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you much so for much. attending. <laughs> have a great rest of KubeCon. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, plug in back the Maintainer Summit India uh, slide again. We do have some unconference blogs, and we are pooling ideas for the unconference blogs. So if you have ideas, do reach out to us. You can maybe ping uh, Nabarun and myself. We both are chairing the event. Or you can reach out to uh, anybody, in, like just, just drop a message in SIG Contribux on Kubernetes cha uh, Slack channel. Uh, we are really happy to hear your ideas and include them in our Thank you.